I started off always wanting to do this. Uh, I saw a blacksmith when I was probably seven or eight at a living history museum in Sturbridge, Mass. It was probably late 70s, early 80s. There's was like a ton of people there and I can hear it, but I can't see it. And my dad, I remember he picks me up and he throws me on his shoulder so I can see. And I see this blacksmith, this big burly guy with a beard and he takes the piece out of the fire and he puts it on the anvil and he hits it. Sparks go flying and I was like, ah, doing that. And just never grew up from that. There's quite a bit of expertise needed to make a knife. First step is just to, t uh, to assemble the billet and TIG weld it together so that it'll hold together while I heat it. Bring it up to its welding temperature and it'll outgas carbon as CO2. And there will be no oxygen in that weld. And then when I hammer it together, it becomes one piece. The large power hammer we have is a nozzle 4B. It was built about 1915-ish. And it is a 450 pound tough weight, which means that's what the ram weighs. I remember every time I went to see a blacksmith when I was a kid, that's what I judged. That's it, I had to watch him. And it was the first place I went whenever we went. And I started to mess around and I remember stealing my dad's propane torch and you know, all the little nail swords. <laughs> I would, uh, I would use the propane torch and I'd, I'd use a pair of vice grips to hold it. And I would heat it up and I would take a small little hammer and bang, 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 bang. Bang, bang, bang. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just flat. And I'll forge it down square. And then I'll push the corners in and turn it 90 degrees. What I'm trying to do is form the layers into C's. forge all my blades, everything is done the way our ancestors did it. Culinary knives especially have been around forever. If you go back far enough, there's Roman era bronze knives, Greek era bronze knives that are specifically for cooking. And you can take from all of that history and bring it into modern culture. And they're made to last hundreds of years. Beyond the artistic side of it, beyond the tradition side of it, you know the person who made this thing came from my hand to you, you know, and you're buying a piece of me. Once I have them cut to size, I bring them over to the surface grinder and surface grind the surface finish down so that they're perfectly flat and they mate with no light. When I went to high school, I went to a tech school because I was interested in working with metal, so I went to a machine shop program. And I graduated from, from that. But I found that the tolerances and the kind of machining that is common in the Northeast wasn't for me. It was too much stress to work on a million dollar part at a half a micron. I just didn't want to do it. And I weld that the same way with a TIG welder and then back into the forge and forge weld it. Drawing it out helps me to picture how it's gonna lay out in the knife, and then I can kind of imagine it as it stretches to see the form of the knife. Cool. And what I ended up doing was stacking them for S's and then stacking again so that the pattern kind of does this. And now if I forge that one block out into a knife, I'd have a, a huge knife, but the pattern would be really stretched out. I want to keep the iteration the same, so I cut thinner slabs out of the block. 
and I cut it into three pieces so I can forge three knives out of that same block. So I got into fabrication and I was doing blacksmithing on the side, just as for fun. So it was basically a hobby. And then somebody was like, hey, we have a red fair, you want a table? The first fair I did was a Connecticut Renaissance fair. It was behind a motel in Pomfret. It was like all 10 vendors. I put a tent up, yeah, I didn't make much money. And then somebody got my name from that one and said, hey, do you want to come and demo and do a show here? We need, you know, we need somebody. So, all right, I don't have anything to do. And then that led to another show and another show and another show. I did that for 15 years. The reason I cut off the point is so that I don't stretch the pattern as much at the tip. If I leave it and try to forge it all out, and the pattern in, ends up elongating and just looking like straight lines at the point, and it just, it seems a waste. I start to pull the heel out, that heel gets wider, but it also gets longer on one edge. So it'll curl the tip up. So I pre-curve the tip down to help kind of keep it centered. And then I just kind of control where the volume of the material is moving by switching from the cross pin, the straight edge of the hammer and the flat side of the hammer. When I use the cross paint, I can direct the motion of the material a little bit more accurately. But if I use it too much, I end up putting grooving and that'll show in the pattern. I kind of got stuck. I couldn't quite make enough money to afford to live and move into a better space. And that was when Jamie, Peter, and I got, got in business together. The three of us started a, the ironwork business on the other side. We did railing work for a lot of really high-end homes. And at the time, the ironwork business was like gangbusters. We had more work that we could do. So for five years, we did both, which was awful because um, you know, we would build knives and swords in the winter and try to build up stock, but then the fares would hit and we wouldn't have enough material. So it was constantly trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. I just couldn't do it after a while. Every time you heat it and cool it, the structure changes, but also every time you heat and cool it and put it on the anvil, that'll do something different. Every time you hit it, it'll break up a structure. So you have what's called a mixed microstructure after forging. And you wanna make sure that's all completely even. So you do a normalizing cycle. Heat it up hot and let it cool. Generally speaking, I let it cool down to 1200 degrees or so and then I quench in oil. And then it goes into the oven at 1475 degrees in an argon rich environment. And then quenched in Parks 50, which is a quench oil. I want to make sure that my knife is above 64 Rockwell. If it didn't get there, then probably not all the carbon went into solution. It didn't quench fast enough. Something went wrong in the process. As long as it went above there, that's pretty confident that I know it fully converted to martensite, which is hardened steel. 
Then I put it in the oven again at 375 for two hours. That tempers it. And then it's ready to grind. I'm trying to make the knife have a parallelish spine, a taper, and then the last quarter of the knife or the third of the knife is going to sweep down to nothing. And that helps like when I'm cutting a potato or something, it'll help get air behind it so it just falls off. I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I ever really took it seriously until like the last six or seven years. Like, I don't think I took business in general seriously until my son was born. I stayed home with him for the first year and a half. So while I was staying home with him, it was, you know, uh, I couldn't keep up with what was going on in the shop with the railing shop. So I, I started primarily making knives during that period um, because it was the only way I could really like make a living. That was something that forced me to really look at what I was doing, how I was doing it, what I was doing wrong. Kind of made me grow up as a business person. Bills are piling up, things aren't being paid. I'm borrowing money left and right from people. And it was like, kind of, I can't do this anymore. I have to find a way that, to survive this. I started teaching a lot more during that time too. And it'd be one thing for me to leave for the weekend and say to my wife, I'm going to teach this class. I'm coming home with this much money. That's one thing. But, you know, oh, I'm going to go away and go to this rent fair for three days. And I might come home broke or I might come home in debt or I might come home with 500 bucks. It's, she's, this is a lot harder sell. And then... Uh, Forge and Fire happened. There was a open casting call. I talked to my wife. I said, hey, I'm going to put my name in for this because, you know, I could be away for a week. It's not the worst. Just filled out the form. Then I did a Skype interview, another Skype interview. And then one day I just got a call from him saying, so your plane's going to leave this day and you're going to be here and you're going to be in Seattle for a week. I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> that was the thing that made it so I could do this. I got my JS the same year. Those two things kind of accumulated with me starting to get more traction, which made my classes fill faster, which made my knives sell faster, which made, made it so I could really take this more seriously. I would always try to do the big sword and, and, oh, I'll make this awesome, totally sweet blade. It'll be five grand and I'll sell it and I'll make money. And like, that's great, but then you have money for a month. You don't have money for the next four months. And you spent all your energy making that thing to get that big score. And now you're looking around for another job and there isn't one. Whereas if you instead spent all your energy doing a little bit of a knife, make sure it gets out and see people, make sure it sells, Make sure you do some tools and do this and do that and have more of a diffuse base of income so you have a bunch of little streams of revenue that just sort of flow in. And then you take on that job. Then you can, then you can have a, a score that's nice, but like it's not a score anymore. It's just added revenue. 
because you don't really need it. By having a piece of G10 that's pretty stable, it kind of caps the ingrain and keeps it from swelling and it'll keep it from, from breaking that glue bond, which is really the only place that it can break. So I, I like to have an intermediate that'll move a little bit more like the wood and a little less like the metal. So chef handles especially should have good, what's called indexing. So you should know where the cutting edge is at all times. They should be comfortable in a number of grips. Everybody holds a chef's knife slightly differently and depending on what you're doing, you'll change your grip on it quite a bit. So you don't want a knife handle that just is only comfortable in one grip. The handle design that I've gravitated towards this, this kind of D shape where the corners cut off came from a Japanese handle that I saw and I've modified and it's very angular, very modern, very aggressive, but it's still classy. Once I have the handle shaped and everything's polished, it, it goes really fast. At that point, it's, it's basically finished. It's just that last 10%. Last 10% is the part everybody sees. Yeah. <laughs> it's the important part. Yeah. It's, the, it's the important bit, you know. But, you know, the, the etching, finishing, polishing, that's the last 10%. And that's the, the, the quick part, but it's the most important. I mean, I've gotten stitches a number, number of times. I have scars all over my hands, constantly cut up. You know, I work with all kinds of nasty chemicals, you know, epoxies are horribly carcinogenic. Um, work with acids all the time it it's there's a lot of things that you you deal with as a knife maker that are not safe and you know you just have to know that they're not safe and then think about how to keep yourself safe around them
honestly, this is like a calling for me. Like I can't, I've tried to quit knife making. I've tried to quit sword making. Doesn't work. I'll come back to it. I might as well just concede it and do it. <laughs> And I enjoy it. I do enjoy it. There's a certain weird satisfaction, even though it's laborious and torturous and it beats your body up. But, you know, it's satisfying in a very meaningful way. The center of the home is the kitchen, and the center of the kitchen is the knife. So, cooking. Cooking with one of my knives is a special kind of joy, and sharing it with people, that's fun. You know? it, was a, it was a lot of fun to, to, to prepare a meal with a knife that I had literally finished minutes before, and, uh, and make some good, yummy food. Bon appetit. <laughs>